Hello and welcome to Flory Models. Here we are on Tuesday the 14th of January 2019 and we've been pushing on like a good one. As I say, Millennium Falcon, um, part four of that went up yesterday and that gets us to here. So we've basically done the underside, we've got the gun system down in here and all the other bits and the top half coming together very, very nicely. Just got to finish up around the back end of that one to push on, but I thought we'd have a little bit of a break from doing the actual Falcon and move on. I have to put this around this way with this little gem which is the actual Gloucester Gladiator so as you can see just down in here we've started working the cockpit so we've got the interior it's got a beautiful interior to all of this one with some very very nice parts right the way through fully detailed down in here the engine looks really really nice with it and so far going through obviously it's very early stages yet but it's fantastic typical ICM as in the parts will click together and testimony to the kit is I put all the cockpit together roughly put it in situ put the halves together and it all basically held its own shape um, to go through just to see a fit line out and how we're going to go about it and then literally just disassembled it for painting and weathering and things like that and here we are we're back to it again but it all went together really really nicely so it looks like it's going to be a very very nice kit but the surface detail is something that's really just popping out to it this flatness of the plastic is lending really really well and I know technically it's already get painted and we're going to lose it all anyway but actually just at the moment it's looking to be a fantastic kit so again kudos to ICM they are definitely one of my favorite manufacturers out there purely because it's straightforward there's no over complicating the build like some things and generally just going through the motions of putting it together quite quick and simply to get on with the build which I'm actually loving at the moment but anyway pushing on with this one first part of this one will be up with you on Friday and then obviously we'll be making our way through and then next week I'll be starting on the MiG-23 as well so we'll sort of have all three going on at the same time but hopefully then the Millennium Falcon will be done and just ready for painting and that will be then over to the bay and then obviously hopefully this won't take too long at all we'll have this thing somewhat together and then we can work on with the MiG and the MiG's a little bit more in depth because we've got aftermarket bits and pieces with that one because I have got wheel wells and various things haven't quite made my mind up I'd love it to be in flight I think it's a great jet in flight and looks really ugly on the ground the MiG-23 so I'm thinking might do it as an in flight with a nice display stand for it I'm not sure yet but anyway this thing will be on the ground because it's permanent gear anyway very very nice kit though going on very nicely with that a couple of things I have been up to today uh, we've been playing with Buster purely because let me just put the lid on properly before I spill it everywhere there we go we have been playing with rapid thinners and metal paints you know basically the silvers of this world and all the rest of it because everybody's been telling me that it's some golden bullet and it, it's magic and it's fantastic for it and it's specially designed for it this that and the other uh, so I thought right well we'll have a go with it and then hopefully you can see where we've gone can you see we've actually put this panel in here the entire the tail's been done with it and we've put a couple of little panels in really just to see how it goes and how it's resistant to masking tape and stuff like that whilst I don't think it's a mass game changer that everybody's been telling me oh you need to do this it's a you know it's totally fantastic I think what it does do is speeds up the drying time because it's great because it's workable and maskable almost instantly which is always a bonus but it does go down well but I just don't think it's much different from using something like a self-leveling thinner so you might remember on here we've got a couple of different areas going on here uh, this obviously is just the chrome which is the Molotov stuff which is being worn off because it got handled a lot at Telford but then down in here we've got the super metallics and then over here we've got the buffer balls all right so what I did was I put in here which is the new way of doing it and then in here just to see how it stacks up against old coats and everything else and it has still gone down beautifully smooth no problem at all but up here was the real test for it so what I did was on the tail I actually flooded it I mean proper just chucked it all onto it just to see what happened because that's just gnarly and horrible on here and it's great it's worked really really well so that's where the rapid thinners actually comes along quite nicely because instead of it giving it time all to dry and sort itself out and you end up with like big dark patches and light patches and stuff like that it just evaporates and gets on with it really well so in some ways I would say if you're a um, the best way of putting this if you're not very good shall we say at doing um, metallic type finishes and we're not talking metallizers but just silvers in general and you find you get that grittiness and it doesn't seem to go down very nicely highly recommend doing it rapid thinners because you chuck it down it doesn't seem to care anyway how it goes 
goes down and I said I use these with the super metallics too and we just went to town with it and it just stuck and it went down beautifully no problem at all and to be honest I did it under here as well and we just threw it on had no issues with it anywhere so that's great because if you'd used it with something like a, uh, a slower uh, setting thinner so something like self-leveling thinners like this one the chances are it would look quite gritty um, as it dries back as it sort of settles and goes down so obviously I think rapid thinners probably does work better with using it on metallics but I don't think it's the be all and end all I can't recommend just running out and buying it and ditching this one because to be honest if you're putting it down normally you're not gonna have any problems with it at all but it does dry very quickly and I think this is where I'm sort of loving this over the actual self-leveling thinners is the ability to be able to spray something and then within minutes you can hold it uh, and without that fear of the eggshell effect as I call it so that bit where you you've got hold of your model and you're talking away and then you take your finger when you feel it pull off and you're like Shit. you know and before you know it you've got a very nice fingerprint in your model which you know you're gonna have to sand out because no amount of overcoating is gonna cure that problem at all so definitely I don't think I'm going to be getting self-leveling thinners again. I'll just get the rapid thinners because it dries instantly. And the other thing as well, if you're doing armour or basically any type of sort of normal military aircraft, then it will give you a nice flat finish. So you're not going to have to worry about it. Yes, obviously, if you're going to be doing deckling and stuff like that, you are going to have to gloss coat before going it. But it just dries really, really quick. So it just speeds up your processing of going down and be able to move on to it and going on with things like masking. And that's what we did on this one. So around about five minutes after I'd sprayed it I masked it and did the tear technique nothing at all this stuff was bulletproof it's on there and dried off completely not only on the surface but obviously right the way down to the bottom because sometimes what can happen is if you're using like self-leveling thinners and we've all done it you spray you mask it and then you peel off and because it was still soft on the bottom it's just peeled off from it so it's caught on the top and just ripped it clean off so definitely so whilst this is one of those sort of you know well what you're trying to tell us I don't think it's a game changer and I think if you've got a shed load of another thinner just wait till you run out before you run off and buy this one but I'm probably going to switch over to using uh, Mr. Color Rapid Thinners purely from a work point of view and with speed so little jobs you're doing you know you can just spray it do it and get on with weathering and masking straight away without having to technically wait a few hours for it to totally dry off before you come back with the next level so forth and so on so I think that just helps out but all of that said if you're doing anything and you want more of a satin finish and if you're definitely wanting a gloss finish you don't want to go anywhere near this because by its nature it dries really quick and everything dries very very flat and uh, Andy was talking to Matt about this stuff and using it with Tamiya's uh, clear flat or flat clear uh, XF86 and they were saying that the trouble is if you use it with uh, self-leveling thinners you tend to get more of a sort of satin finish which I think is great for aircraft don't get me wrong but if you're doing armor it's always a little bit not right but by using this stuff with this with rapid thinners it's dead flat so it's absolutely fantastic for using it on armor and things like that especially when you want to hide the silvering effect or the shininess I should say of decals and things like that so there you go so both of them have their place at the end of the day if you're doing anything satin glossy something else like that then obviously you're going to go with self-leveling thinners in amongst your normal stuff if you want it just to dry instantly and have a nice flat finish then obviously you're going to go rapid thinners again it's one of those they complement each other and it wouldn't harm to have a bottle of each floating around the place but just from my point of view to be honest i've got another bottle of uh self-leveling thinners up there I'm probably not going to be reordering that for a while because I'm just going to be standalone going along using rapid thinners with pretty much everything. But again, with metallic stuff like that, I thought maybe they would need to sort of settle down and sort themselves out. Well, they don't. They just prefer this stuff and go right the way through. So there we go. I know I've been saying about it since before Christmas about having a play with it and then on test and having a go with Buster. Yes, definitely. It works. It's very, very nice. It's a good solid color as well it covers very very easily even though it was thinned more than 50 50 it's probably more like a 60 40 mix uh to thinners over paint and it just covered beautifully because this was all black under here and i just went through and sprayed that and then down on here as you can see you can see the panel in there and we did this panel here with it and the entire of this tail and again the big thing is this tail was horrible um you might remember it had a swap sticker in here for god's sake and it had various things we've masked and overcoated just chucked it down and it worked and that's the nice thing to it so hats off so i think it works very very nicely and to be honest with you because we're doing the gladiator 
in this sort of doped, um, you know, uh, silver effect on this one, it's probably how I'm going to be using it on this because again, it gives you that nice even colour to it as well without being too much of a problem. But yeah, should be a lot of fun with this one because this particular build, I am not going to be doing it in this. I'm going to do it in that more traditional dope linen silver effect with the actual um, blue and with the actual roundels on there. I think it looks really, really nice and it's more the classic gladiator as I know it rather than it being in the camo. So that's my plan with this one. So it should be a lot of fun to see how that one comes out. Anyway, it is Tuesday. And I thought we'd pop over and have a look at the questions. So to save me having to edit it all sort of together, I'll just read them out this week. Uh, so Paul says, hi Phil, uh, would you be able to build the Hawker Hurricane Mark I Battle of Britain from the Airfix kit, then he's got the number, uh, which is the Tropical Mark I? Uh, I can't find an actual, the normal Mark I Hurricane kit anywhere. Um, I'm not sure because obviously the tropical one's got the radiator on the chin if it's got both in the kit. Now, I would love to say you can because I'm sure this question's popped up before when we've had some of the live shows and the guys have said, yes, it's got both in the kit but I can't remember off the top of my head if it actually has. So hopefully somebody in the chat can actually just pop down um, after the show and below the show notes and pop in if you can or can't. If you've got that kit, have a quick fumble for it and have a look to see if uh, we, you can actually do it in there or not. That'd be a very much a help. I've got a feeling this question's come up before and somebody said you can, it's in there. Um, but I'm not sure if that was the sea hurricane as well because obviously the sea hurricane we weren't sure if you could make a normal hurricane out of it uh, depending on how they've actually got the parts counts uh, in the box and things like that okay so keith says hi phil um sometimes during the tricky stage of an aircraft model i need three hands to manipulate uh the components to the correct place and a third hand to manipulate the model to the best angle for visual uh, for build access is there anything on the market uh, and the system that gimbals that will give the model the best access to be honest with you when it comes to that type of thing because i it's one of those ones this is one of those where it's what i would do normally but because i have cameras and i have to sort of allow for you guys watching and stuff like that then uh yeah it's a little bit difficult because this is here it's not in camera shot because it's crutch camp and i yeah you don't want no one needs to see that but what i've got is one of these so this is a very very cheap i think it was a tenner but this is on a ball joint um so it's on like this so what you can actually do then if you needed to is take a clamp if you wanted to do it via a clamp rather than anything else and i'm just thinking what else have we got probably a good way of doing this uh but if you were doing something for instance with buster uh and you wanted him in here, so I don't know what's at the back end of Buster or in his throat or anything else. But what you can do is either put him in it completely, so he's just in there a little bit like that, and then you can, in theory, slacken off this back bit, and you can manoeuvre him round to exactly how you would need it. So say that's just assuming you were in there. It's definitely the wrong way. Hold on. You know, you could then get in there, and then you've got two hands to be able to get in. Okay, something like that. But also, as I say, it's not just with Buster. If I've had other things to deal with, you know, if you were doing things in here and then, you know, perhaps I do this a lot, you can just get something like the crocodile clip down in here, then you can slacken this off and then you can grab a part on here and let's assume you needed to, you know, get in amongst it like this. You can just come along and get in there. So uh, one of these is actually quite handy. Um, I do use it all the time. The other thing that's quite nice with this is purely because it is on a G clamp, so you can just position it. And these you can buy, this is a metal one, I can't even remember where this one came from, I've had donkey's years now. But literally, because it's a G clamp, just clamps to your bench, you can maneuver it to anywhere you want, and it will go complete 90 degrees to the side, and then obviously you can go up with it. So the jaw will go absolutely any direction, and then obviously the top bit rotates and everything goes. So it is quite handy to have for doing all the you know, wait, let's go that way. There we go. So it is quite handy to have something. So this is technically my third hand, if you wanted to call it, for things like that. Again, if I'm doing soldering work, this is what I tend to use as well because you can't get in there too well. So sometimes I'll pop that in there just like that for getting hold of it. There is a few other things on the market. There's the one which has got tiny little crocodile clips on their own little arms that come off everywhere. Uh, looks a bit like an octopus uh, with those. So you can actually get the crocodile clips, push them together, holding two parts. They're great. For 
for soldering and for joining up things, stuff like that. There is those on the market. Uh, but generally, that's what I would go with. Because again, you could put things like spring-loaded clamps in there and away you go. You're absolutely golden with it. It's very straightforward just to clamp apart and go on with it. When I'm doing aircraft, for instance, and they're drying, I pop them in there. So in case it, the runs, so you angle it so the runs don't run to certain areas and things like that. If it's a very wet coat of gloss, things like that on there. So that's what I use that for. But that's pretty much what I would recommend. It's dead, dead handy to have that. It's always that thing we all could do with another pair of hands in this job. Uh, so if you've got something like that, you can just clamp things in and away you go. It's a lot easier. Okay, so uh, Frankie Fast says, uh, Hey Phil, just wanted to let you know that the recent MATV uh, kit by Ryfield Models is great. Your review was spot on. Uh, on Wednesday's vlog, you were inquiring about licensing for such uh, and uh, such for them. The MATV was designed and built by Oshkosh Defense USA. I know as I'm a factory trained instructor for the MATV and a few other vehicles uh, and weapon systems. Uh, I drew the short straw and became a trainer on these systems whilst ordering items for my unit uh, for the rapid fielding uh, uh, what was that initiative? I guess I was the only one that could be trusted with the credit card. Licensing for 99% of US uh, military purchases items are uh, uh, forted uh, when they are referred to by their model number. This is why uh, you see them listed as an M model designation. Oshkosh uh, was adamant. Uh, to us about referring to it as the M-ATV and not a military design because of licensing. They were also adamant uh, not to call it the M-A-T-V because that was somebody else's copyright. Uh, it's all very crazy, but licensing is what happens where, uh, when you pay lawyers by a percentage instead of by the hour. All of a sudden, intellectual property uh, laws uh, pop up and everyone is guilty of theft. Trust me, I know all about that all too well. Flashbacks. Uh, I studied law at college and again uh, in the military through various schools and courses. Although I specialise in inter intelligence uh, and intellectual treaty law, I still have to take uh, torts on property law. Uh, it's all very sticky subject uh, and uh, in this case only a good uh, as the percent you can find the offset. Uh, I don't want to bore you any longer. Keep up the great with the reviews. So there you go. So that's why they give them funny designations so no one has to pay it or anything else. But it's still got Oshkosh on the number plate, sorry, the, the mud guards. So does that mean that Ryfield paid and the logo did pay royalties to Oshkosh for the vehicle. That's what I want to know. But that's clearly why they don't call it the Oshkosh MRAP and all the rest of it, or the MATV. So yes, that's probably why they're getting out of it. But also it had Michelin on the tires, so is that a thing as well? That's what we need to know. Okay, but thank you for that. Uh, Mike says, hiya Phil, have Airfix uh, eroded off your shadow stands? Probably. Who knows? They seem to be everywhere now. Everyone's doing it. If you remember, I did a, a video a couple of weeks ago about that. Uh, David says, Phil, I've watched several other reviews of the uh, Border Models 135th Panzer IV, uh, all of which include the black metal uh, barrel as standard. And those things I was describing as little caps or something, it turns out that those are smoke dischargers. Uh, uh, and their decal sheets appear to be in register. I think you may have reviewed the one that slipped through quality control. It turns out it's definitely not the barrels because we spoke to the importer. Uh, that's who I was speaking to. They don't come with them uh, into the UK. If you've ordered direct from somewhere, perhaps those did. Again, I just get it. I uh, don't open it. I know nothing about it until I do the review. So that is the difference. It's not like I've been prepped, shall we say, by um, somebody else to say about the kit. I just do on what I've got literally in front of me, and I think that shows it. Otherwise, I'll probably have had a better one. Uh, right, Scooby says, Hiya, Phil. I'm building the Italeri Ford Focus. I'm planning uh, painting it white. Uh, I can't remember what is the best primer colour to give uh, the white a real good luster. Many thanks uh, to you and the team, but um, okay. So again, it's always a little bit tricky one because it depends on two things. Okay, you can go with black base in it, so give it a black coat purely because white 
looks solid if it's got black behind it. If you've got a, you know, you've got, and we, we see it all the time where it comes in white plastic because it's a car, and then you paint it white, it's never got that solid look. That's because the light is actually coming through the plastic and then into the paintwork and stuff like that. So it's never got that pure solid look. You might remember what I've said, when I've done like aircraft uh, landing gear and stuff like that, if you're doing it with like uh, 70 second scale stuff and 48th as well, but if you uh, pre-paint all the gear in black then put white they have a real solid heavy look to them yeah if they're just white they just look flimsy and not very nice and it, it's a, that thing it's just a solidness look to the item same thing can happen when doing cars but if you've got a very large vehicle and then you're going to be doing it in black if you're coming along with other colors like yellow light orange reds even things like that they can be a real problem to try and overcoat that initial black because you've got to build up layer and layer and layer into it to actually cover that color so if you want to play safe use gray and that's why gray is probably the most widely used primer out there because it's a bit of both in between okay so that's why people use gray primer for pretty much everything but that said if you're doing yellow if you're doing red especially and certain other colors a white primer works extremely well so what it might be worth doing just for speed in that is come along black primer it so you've got the plastic is all done in black then go over it with like a white primer okay and then sand and feel it down make sure it's okay another coat if you're okay and then just put white right over the top and that will just save you having to build up 10, 20 coats just to solidly get rid of that other color underneath. We spoke about it before, orange as well, like fresh and oranges and stuff. If you've got gray under it, to put, you know, obviously orange over the top, it takes a few coats just to kill it in there. But if you've got white, a couple of coats and you're done. So it just depends on how many coats of paint you want to mess around and do. Personally, I would do it black and you know you're safe, then put white primer over the top and then just paint it white, okay? Because you're then just building up that top coat rather than having to build up the coats to cover the black, if that makes sense. But again, it's one of those ones where it's, it just depends really how far you really want to go with it. Sometimes stick with gray and you're just in there from both parts. Okay, Peter, he says, uh, Hi Phil, I'm new here and just getting back to modeling after a 20 year break. Uh, wanting to do things properly, uh, I'm working on the 1 to 200 scale Boeing 767-300 and loved your uh, airliner build, build video. Uh, I noticed there's a lot of content on airbrushing whilst I don't have an, uh, sorry, whilst I don't have airbrush equipment yet. I'm wondering if I'm going, uh, if I'm going for a high gloss mirror finish, uh, is this all possible or achievable by hand painting with brushes? Or are you purely going only to get this type with an airbrush? Apologies if this may be a newbie question. Not at all, no such thing as a stupid question. Keep them coming, I love answering them. Okay, this is one of those ones where, again, in the old days, we all used to use brush painting and you can get a lovely gloss finish. It just takes a little bit more work, shall we say. So yes, of course you can. So what you really wanna be doing, if you're hand painting for a true gloss, like you do on an aircraft, you wanna thin your paint a little bit and build up your layers. That way you're not getting chunky paint, shall we say, or brush marks and things like that. You can sand in between the layers of paint as well. We're using very, very fine sandpaper and just sand them down tack cloth it all off so there's no dust and no particles going to go in the paint then give it the next coat when you're coming into the glossing as well gloss hand painting i think in some ways or de definitely from my point of view is easier by hand than it is with an airbrush because it has a habit of self-leveling so even if you're using something like johnson's floor polish for instance and that's the way i used to do it okay hand painting that is so much more of a lust glossed finish than it is if you airbrush it because you airbrush it i was used to get a satin effect okay but if you put it down by hand you get a true gloss effect but a lot of it is is preparation taking your time sanding between the coats so any imperfections are taken off at that stage before you put the next one on uh, and go through it but yes it's definitely possible we've got lots of people on the forum who hand paint and do some fantastic work i've got a good friend of mine i spoke about him a lot who i will get on one day um he only hand paints and he makes stuff that makes me look like a two-year-old doing this okay uh and he's very very good at it um so yeah it's one of those things where just taking your time going through it with airbrushing i think it's a little bit easier purely because you can actually you know like i do two pat lacquer it for instance the stuff comes out like treacle it's drying it's dry within 20 minutes of putting it on and it's bomb proof within a couple of hours okay that's the way i like to do it and when i do glossing of airliners and stuff like that you'll see i chuck this stuff on you leave it you don't get any runs no nothing 
it, it's really nice stuff to work with. And that was the light bulb moment for me, switching um, from hand painting gloss to airbrushing gloss. But it's definitely a doable thing. I think it's just one of those things, if you've not got all the equipment, just have a go with it. But again, you know, as a hand painter, apologies, as a hand painter, let me just turn that off where it keeps going. Okay, it's one of those things. It's all to do with thinning the coats of paint Okay, making sure they're quite thin and just building them up one after the other. And then that way you'll get a good mirror finish at the end of it. Thing is, if you go in too quick and you're just banging it down, you're going to get brush marks into it and it doesn't carry through very well as you're making your way through with all of them. Right, what else have we got? Okay, Chris says, hi Phil, um, I'm looking to do the same MiG-23 as you for the group build, whilst I'm sure you're going to do uh, a full feature on the build, uh, but for time reasons, can I ask what colour match for the tiger stripes uh, for the decals? Uh, right, I've been attacking my buster with various ideas with no success. Right, okay, well to be honest with you, I haven't even looked at it yet, so hold on, let me just have a look in here, uh, and just see what it says. Uh, for them and get a thing. I have thought that the actual tiger stripes, which are in here somewhere, should be a color code for those. So it's got a little thing on here that says, you yeah, know, the decal sheets on these, that says about it. Now, the one we're planning on doing is this one. This is the one we're talking about. So I'm hoping in here somewhere, they're actually gonna tell us what that said color is. So, Right, okay, that's brilliant. Thank you, Odard. They haven't. They're literally just saying that it's grey. Number 39, grey. So, yeah, what we're going to have to do is probably do a little bit of a colour match to this one. Looking at it, it's going to be a standard colour. Because purely when they do this type of thing, uh, and they're doing these various uh, colours on their aircraft, they don't normally go out and get a specific paint. They'll use what they've got. So this will be a standard grey colour, I'm sure, of it. Just looking at it, not too sure. So what will be is that I will have to come along and do my homework on this one. And obviously having just read your question now, I don't know. So it could be that it is just literally like a dark ghost gray or something else in there on this one. But again, I'm not sure. But being a Czech color as well, it's 50-50 on if it will be a Western color or if it's not. Looking at photos of it and things as I've seen, I'll be going towards a maybe Again, it's one of those things, looking at the pictures, it looks a lot more blue than the decals do, so it may be that thing. I was thinking it's that probably that sort of top F-14 colour. Federal Standard was at 36237, I think it is, whatever it is, the Tomcat top colour. I thought that's what it was. It has that reminiscence colour to me. But again, I will have to match it to the decals because I'm going to use the decals. There's no way I'm going to freehand that camo scheme onto that one. But again, I can't really comment. I will, when I get to it, well, I'll go right the way through it. So put it to side for one minute. Give me a couple of weeks and I'll catch up with you. Okay, David says, um, uh, actually, I think he's answering somebody else. Uh, Hi, Peter. I don't know if Phil is a high gloss mirror finish, but he was look at, oh, he's talking about Plasmo's done something uh, with them and polishing and all the rest of it. Again, it, it's one of those things. If you're, um, if you're polishing, just be careful with clear because clear doesn't like being polished because it can soften. So you want a hard one like a lacquer or a single lacquer or a two-pack lacquer so it goes rock hard if you're going to be polishing okay, and going through them. But again, I think we're more talking about the paint finish rather than just the polishing section. Okay, so Neil says, hi Phil, uh, why did they use parts from other kits uh, or models to create the detailed shape on the original Star Wars model? So it's all these little bits in here. Um, wouldn't it have been easier and cheaper just to cast or scratch rather than rummaging around all the parts bins for kits to see what parts fitted and looked best? Or perhaps they did it as a bit of a fun treasure hunt for fans. No, it, it's... Technically kit bashing, um, it was a staple part of it. And don't forget, I think one of the first ones to actually do it was in Space 1999, which is, I just happened to have one here, was these. Um, because these are actually just made up of all sorts of various kit bash parts as well. Okay, and I think it was just that thing where, you know, going through to add amounts of detail. So when you're looking at it, the power thing like down in here to recreate something like that would be quite technical to do 
Um, but I think if you're coming in and you're thinking, do you know what, if we just use bits of other things, so down in here, you can probably see that's the back half of a tank. You know, there's obviously a grill in there, engine block. You can see various other details down in these. And also when you look at, across them like that there, here we go, this is the one I can show you. This bit here, which is in the video part that went up yesterday, I'm pretty sure is this bit on Buster because they look identical. This back piece here looks just like that section there on a Corsair. So, sorry, Crusader. So that's what I was thinking. But when you look around on these, definitely you can see just big parts of tanks. So for instance, you can probably see it here. That's the back end of a uh, Panther. That's another back end of a Panther. So they've used three back ends of Panthers and it's all hiding literally in plain sight. And as you can probably see here, this is the drive uh, area on a tank, various things, and as you say, you go right the way through. One of the guys did link up, and I've got all the photos for it, so I might put them onto the actual uh, link them onto the build for the Falcon, which names the parts that were all there. You might remember this bit in here, this section here. This is the actual bit off of a gearbox transmission, off of, I think it's a 1 6 scale Toyota car, some various things, but it's a quick way of making detail. So if you was to try and scratch build this uh, by using own parts, you'd have to whittle tiny little details and, and veins and various things to it. Uh, so it's quicker just to use a bit of a tank, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the other. But when what they would probably do, certainly we know the big one, the big five footer was done individually, but some of the others, what they'll do is that once they've cast one, they'll then cast from it and use the casting of it that goes on. We know they did that with the actual um, Star Destroyer. So what they would do is do a certain section of it, take a cast from it, then use the cast on the next section to replicate it as it goes round and all the rest of it, which is a great way of speeding up the build. But doing your initial one of coming through, of having to do an entire five foot model like this, you know, and to give it this level of detail, and bearing in mind there's a lot more detail that's gonna go on this yet with all the other bits and pieces, to scratch build it would take forever but you could get away with thinking oh look back end of a tank by the time it's painted and got pipes over it and all the rest of it no one's going to notice and it is the thing for years and years when you look at these you don't think that's the back end of a tank i've shown it before i haven't actually got one here it's upstairs but if you look at the back of an x-wing it's a sherman tank it's literally the upper hull of a Sherman tank on the back of an X-Wing. It's looking you at the face every time, but you don't see it because it's hiding in plain sight. But it's got great because you've got the hatches, you've got the drivers and, and the bow gunners uh, hatch there right in front of you. You've got all the various bits. Nothing's been changed, it's just there. Other things as well, I think it's like Persian tank, the grills at the back. They're used all, there you go, actually it's here, all over them. So, because they've got quite large grills at the back of those, they just pop them on and away you go and you know, it's all very straightforward. But because of the way they cleverly do it and hide it amongst other parts, it's just a great way of adding detail very, very quickly. But as I say, to scratch build the entire thing, yeah, that would take forever. So it's just saving time and energy to be able to do it. It was a process that was sort of done a lot in the UK on some really dodgy programs back in the sort of 60s. Uh, and then obviously through the 70s when this was done, it sort of became an industry way of doing things uh, for special effects and things like that. So it's a case of, well, we'll kit bash something and we'll do it. A lot of these things were used from other props as well. So they would take bits off of one thing and stick it to another to, and so forth and so on just to be able to do it. It's just a quick, easy way of replicating and making detail, so forth and so on as they make their way through. And to be honest, it's one of those sort of hobby legends now that's made its way right the way through this entire thing. So yeah, definitely, I think it's a fun thing to do. I've enjoyed building this one and going through and looking at the parts because when you take the parts off the sprue, it's usually an, an individual part. So like we put those engine casings on and transmission casings from the Mazda, before you put the other bits on, you can see exactly what it is. We spoke about it, we put them on the top, we've got the actual um, the gun mantle from the actual uh, Panther tanks very straightforward, right in your face, but you never notice it. Until it's pointed out to you, you don't expect it to be on here. But it's a bit like if you look at Battlestar Galactica, the Cylon Raider, that's got tank tracks just placed all over it. And again, it's right in your face, it's clearly there, and gun barrels, half a gun barrel is just stuck to it. You know, they're not a gun barrel, they're supposed to be surface detail, but it is a gun barrel, that's all it literally is. But again, it's so much in your face and so it's there, but you don't see it because you're not expecting it and it's hidden amongst other things. And I think it's a magical part of our hobby 
that it was being used in this way. Unfortunately, now with obviously with modern and CGI and stuff like that, it's obviously a bit of a dying art form, but it's great with Star Wars and various things using practical effects and models and stuff like that, that they've actually come back to doing it this way of scratch building and basically kit bashing as it was called uh, to produce detail very, very quickly and easily. But yes, it has been a lot of fun. I have enjoyed uh, going through the actual build though on that one. It's been a lot of fun doing that one. Okay, so, uh, and that is it, I think. Uh, hold on, let me just check if we haven't got any of my other sections. Uh, oh, another one here, talking to Millennium Falcon. Gerald says, Phil, could you please advise me on what lighting system I need for the 144 Bandai Millennium Falcon? It's a bit of a minefield out there. You can buy the one for the kit. They actually do manufacture one, but there's a lot of companies out there which will offer you a cheaper alternative, shall we say, for the lighting kit for the actual Falcon to go through that way. All I would say is, if it's one of those ones where you're putting it in, make sure you can get it out, because if it fails and it's internal to it and you can't get into it ever again, you're stuck because that's it, it's never gonna work again. And to be honest with you, a couple of ones I've been using with electronics in, it's now failed for whatever reason, I can't get in there to change them because they've had it and they're kaput now, which is very annoying because obviously you want to go on forever. So it might be worth going to a more reputable company, shall we say, like the Bandai one that's available, things like that on there. But there is three or four companies who do make them. I don't have any specifics. With my one, I was always intending to put a lighting kit in mine, but I never actually got around to doing it. That was the thing. So um, from that point of view, it's all can be opened up to put it in, but I never actually did it. This one here, the 72nd one, comes with it, as we know, I've shown it on before, and it's all pre-wired and it's all done and ready to go with it. I've got the LEDs down in here and actually in the bay, so it looks fantastic lit up, and obviously with the engine done and the cockpit. But again, that comes with the kit. The others, I'm not sure. I don't know what the quality's like or anything else like that. And what else do we have? Uh, Jaguar. Okay, Kitty Hawk versus Revel Airfix. Tricky. Okay, hi Phil, I've been watching your videos uh, on YouTube for some time, and as a self-described intermediate modeler, found them incredibly useful, uh, finally decided to subscribe. Keep up the fab work. Welcome. Okay, um, he says, I'm uh, having a go at the 148 scale Jaguar, and have just finished watching your build of the KT Hawk 148. Sounds like it was a bit of a nightmare build. Um, I'm not a rivet counter, as long as it looks like a Jag, I'd much rather go for the kit that fits reasonably well. Uh, do you have any experience at the Revel, oh yes, uh, Airfix Repop, um, and how does it compare with the Kitty Hawk fit issues? Okay, a couple of things. I'm a great one at poking fun at Kitty Hawk, purely because it's like a habit now, but actually, is if you're not going to close up the Kitty Hawk kits, generally, any of them, including the Jaguar, they do go together okay. I haven't found any real problems. The only problems that happen is if you try and close doors that they've asked to be open, because sometimes it can have huge gaps around them. Their instructions are a little bit of a nightmare to follow as well and all the rest of it. But generally, out of the box, they're okay, you know. So I wouldn't say they're Tamiya and they're not, you know, like some other companies we work with, definitely not Rightfield or anywhere else like that. But generally, they're, they're okay. It's just that some things which aren't designed to be closed, you think I'm going to close them up, they don't fit full stop because they've never been wanted to. So like gear doors, for instance, stuff like that. The Kitty Hawk one is a classic example. If you try and do it with everything closed up on it, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't go. It, it's just a nightmare, nightmare start to finish. So it can be an incredible nightmare to actually get it all to go. And that's pretty much standard with all their earlier kits. They are getting better, let's face it, as we're making our way through time. Getting back to your question, though, would I go Kitty Hawk or Revel? Don't forget the Revel, which is the Airfix Repop, is now, oh, it's got to be, what, 25 years old? Um, maybe even 30 years old. It's an incredibly old kit. It's definitely showing itself. It has got recessed details, but it's incredibly soft um, to the point where, you know, at the end of the day, I don't, I wouldn't possibly even tackle one anymore. It, it is so old 
when you've got something like the Kitty Hawk one, the Kitty Hawk one, which to be honest is up at the unit in Doncaster, it's actually a really nice kit. The surface detail is beautiful. It's on another level to the actual, um, the FX one. Also, the things you can do with it, like dropping the flaps and the various bits and pieces on it, again, it, it makes it really, really nice and a fantastic kit straight out of the box. The detail is a million times better than the FX one. If I was to build one tomorrow, I'd build a Kitty Hawk one tomorrow. Even with all its little furbles and quirky bits and misfits and all things like that, it's still a far superior kit in detail to anything you're going to get for the Airfix one. The Airfix one is just a basic shape, you know, of a Jag. It does go together well, if I remember rightly. It has a little bit of a Boeing issue, which is the same type of thing as you actually get with the uh, Buccaneer 48 scale one, as in both halves me pulling together, you know, to get them all in. But yeah, it's definitely one of those kits where I would say, look, just you know, go with that. It's a bit like, uh, somebody asked me the other day about the old Airfix um, FA2 Sea Harrier versus the Kitty Hawk one. And it's like, I would never go near an Airfix uh, FA2 Harrier because the Kitty Hawk one is a beautiful kit. Goes together really, really well. Um, sorry, Kinetic. Sea uh, Harrier goes together really, really well. Whereas like the Airfix one really is now a, a kit collector's kit rather than a kit builder's kit, shall we say, purely because of it's not nice. It, it's not on that same level anymore. So again, like with the Jaguar, that's now Kitty Hawks. You never know, somebody else might bring out a really nice one that goes together fantastic. But as modelers, bite the bullet, test fitting, dry fitting, everything. So don't go near it with glue until you know the parts will go together, okay? Test fit things together, subcomponents, get them in there, go through the motions of it. Known that if you want to do it in flight, the chances are nothing's going to fit. So again, just bite the bullet. I did it recently on, I can't remember which even what it was now, something I did in flight recently. Uh, even with the Tamiya Tomcat, the gear isn't designed to be closed. So I closed it up with it. So just get in there. Perfect plastic putty is a great one because it dries really, really quick and it's waterable cleanup. So you just wipe it off with water and it will takes away all the damage without having to sand it. Okay, and then just fill in those gaps, pop around and rescribe it afterwards and you'll be absolutely fine. So don't make a meal out of the faults it's got, just flow with them. That's my best advice to it. The big thing is if you're ever getting to that thing where the kit is fighting you all the way through, don't fight it, go with it. Okay, so think to yourself, okay, doesn't fit. It's got a massive step, what are we gonna do? Okay, well look, let's just get in there with the filler and we'll fill it and we'll worry about it all later, okay? Pop in the surface detail and everything else once you've done it. There's no point trying to finesse it and go, because all you're gonna end up doing is damaging other parts, bending something out of shape, then you'll find something else doesn't fit, a wing won't go on, a big gap on a wing is caused because you've tried to do something else. So it's easier just sometimes to sand it, go in with your own way of doing it uh, and running it like that. Definitely the Jag is a classic example of that. Some things on there just don't go very nicely. So it's easier just to get in there, do it yourself uh, and worry about it all afterwards. That's what my biggest thing to it is. And that is about it for this week. I think we're all good. So don't forget, tomorrow with you, you've got me and Matt, we're gonna be on with you around about sort of two o'clock, between two and three as always, we've got our kit show. So we'll be talking all things industry, all things modeling, all things kits, not doing so much of this, but a lot more of this. Love to get you involved with it as well, so please feel free to join in on the live chat area. So if you guys wanna come along, ask us questions, various things like that, we'll be on with you on there. Then obviously on Thursday night, we've got the live show with the team, we're gonna be on with you at half past seven till nine again. So it's ask things for the thing, we've got new format for that one, one starting as well so um, you know we'd love to get you involved with that one we're having a bit of a discussion about it and then obviously we'll hopefully have a new friendly fun type of show that's the plan for this one's getting a little bit stale so I want to liven it up a little bit and then obviously on Friday I'll be with you hopefully it'll be the first part of the gladiator so we're making our way with that one and then on Sunday don't forget we're at the IPMS Bolton show at the Bolton Wanderers football ground if you've never been to it it's a great show because it's easy parking it's easy to get to and generates a really nice layout in there and it's usually rammed okay as far as I'm aware it is fully booked so there'll be plenty of people there plenty selling lots of things to see all the usual thing I mean the team will be there as well flogging our wares as we normally do with the flooring models and the PM store. So if you need any paints, sanders, kits, all the rest of it, we'll have the usual thing as always with that one. So there we go. That's it from me. Happy modeling. Take care. Catch you all tomorrow.